Out of the Fiery Furnace is brought to you by a company that makes aluminum for transportation, construction, and manufacturers of consumer products all around your house. Commonwealth Aluminum. This is the famous Pillar of Iron in Delhi, in India. The largest piece of iron forged by hand to have come down to us from antiquity. Six tons of metal. It was made as a monument in the fourth century and it's 1,500 years old. This pillar planted in the middle of the earth, halfway geographically between east and west, with its luxury of material and of effort, is one of the very earliest symbols of a confident, positive commitment by men everywhere to a new metal and to a new age. It's a milepost of that time by which the making of iron had become a central preoccupation, a determinant of success or failure and of national survival. Iron became something not just to make, but to emulate. It entered all languages as a synonym for strength and resolution. Before the Iron Age, men had been as strong as oak. Now they would seek to become iron-willed. That change in metaphor signaled a further step away from agriculture and towards industry. And iron changed the quality, if not the form, of a vast number of things in both. It meant better tools and better weapons. Sharper axes, cut down more trees to make more fuel, to make more iron. And it doubled that advantage. It cleared more forests for more cultivation to support larger populations. And when it came to blood and iron, superior swords won decisive wars. Without it, there would be no skyscrapers, no bridges, no engines. Iron is the taproot of our material civilization. Bihar in India has a long metalworking tradition. These techniques have hardly changed over 4,000 years since the second millennium BC. By then, copper and tin, gold and silver and lead were all in widespread use. But the hour of iron had not yet struck. The high craftsmanship of the second millennium and its splendors were startlingly resurrected in 1926 with the unearthing of King Tutankhamun's tomb in Egypt. The young king's body was encased in three coffins, each made from beaten gold. Tutankhamun's mask is a masterwork of the goldsmith's art. It shows no trace of the thousands of hammer blows, 
which shaped that gentle likeness. There is one object from the king's tomb which stands apart. This dagger, with its hilt of gold, has a blade of almost untarnished iron. No analysis of the blade has ever been permitted, so there's no precise knowledge of how Egyptian craftsmen 3,000 years ago achieved such an enduring surface. Iron was a metal which at that time was hardly used. It was considered inferior to other metals. Iron was soft and would not hold an edge. It was also easily oxidized by the atmosphere. Very few iron objects have survived the past 3,000 years. These tools from Palestine of that age show severe deterioration. Bronze tools from Iran, a thousand years older, make the comparison. Bronze develops only a surface film of corrosion, its patina, which protects it from further decay. Events, however, were about to confer upon iron a new and almost everlasting life. At the eastern end of the Mediterranean, in the second millennium BC, trade in metals thrived between ports like Tyre and Sidon, and this one, the ancient Aradus, Arwad today, on the coast of Syria. Copper and other metals were being mined in quantity in Cyprus and Anatolia, and supplied to metal workers in the cities of Egypt, of Crete, and Mesopotamia. But this established order was suddenly disrupted. The great stone walls of the little island of Arwad did not withstand the shock. About 1200 BC, the Eastern Mediterranean, which historically has always been a country of passage, linking Europe to Central Asia, to India and Afghanistan, and through which the circulation of metals had come to have increasing importance, was invaded by the Sea Peoples. It's an indistinct title for what proved to be a sharp calamity. They were waves of migrating invaders from the north who were neither of one race nor of one speech. But in the total disruption to the established patterns of trade which followed, the supplies of tin from distant and still mysterious sources to us were cut off. Without tin, there was no bronze. An age which had lasted for 2,000 years was strangled in a hundred, and it never revived. The whole material balance tipped. Bronze became scarce, Iron, which had been used until then mainly for ornament, begins to appear with increasing regularity in the archaeological record for more mundane things also. Out of the annihilation of the Bronze Age cultures and their cosmopolitanism, and after a period of isolation and anarchy, there slowly emerged the cultures of the Iron Age. BC, a colony of Assyrian traders established themselves among these bizarre rock formations in Cappadocia on the Anatolian plateau in Turkey. The merchants meticulously recorded their business transactions in cuneiform writing on clay tablets. And in these records, around 1,900 BC. There are references to one of the first great empires of the ancient world, the kingdom of the Hittites. Where they came from before settling in Anatolia has never been determined. The Hittite capital was called Hattusa, high in the uplands of northern Anatolia. The huge stone walls run around this stronghold for nearly six kilometers. 
they protected a city of palaces, temples, and houses. From this great base, the Hittites marched down upon much of the known world, capturing Babylon and disputing authority with the other imperial power of their time, Egypt under the pharaohs. Those exhausting wars led to the eclipse of the Hittites. They vanished, scattered by waves of migrations from Europe. Archaeological evidence of the Hittites' existence has only been discovered in the last hundred years. Their language, found on clay tablets, was not finally deciphered until the 1960s. It's all not been enough to decide whether the Hittites really did have the paramountcy in iron making which has been attributed to them. The reputation which these lords of ancient civilization, the Hittites, have for being possibly the first people to make iron of superior quality rests a good deal upon the literary rather than the physical evidence. But clearly there is a basis for the claim. When so much of what is presumed to have happened in the ancient world is overlaid with painful imprecision, it's a pleasure to be able to record that here an actual letter was found incised on clay tablets, which shows that other kingdoms came to the Hittites as supplicants because of their proficiency in iron making. Written 1300 BC, and in a language which has been dead now for more than 3000 years, that clay tablet showed the correspondence between a Hittite ruler and the king of Assyria, who had written asking him for supplies of the good iron which came from here. Nevertheless, the use of iron in the old world was on a very small and restricted scale until after the downfall of the Hittite Empire and the assumed dispersal of its metal craftsmen and their knowledge throughout the Middle East. But taken together, those are the principal reasons why it is that modern archaeometallurgists are inclined to believe that it was very likely here, in Anatolia, in the kingdom of the Hittites, that metalsmiths began to make the technical discoveries, which when they were more widely applied, led to the transformation of iron from a metal inferior to bronze to one which was destined to become a universal replacement for it. The basic technology, successful for thousands of years in smelting copper, failed when it came to iron. The melting point of iron is much higher, more than 1,500 degrees Celsius. In clay furnaces, like this one in the Sudan, such temperatures were unobtainable. At the temperatures which were possible, iron was reduced from its ore without ever becoming liquid or separating from the slag. The result was a spongy mass of slag embedded with grains of iron called a bloom. By hammering the bloom to drive out the slag, a blacksmith could eventually create a bar of almost pure wrought iron. To keep the iron malleable enough to work, the smith kept reheating it in his forge. This produced a subtle but important change. The repeated contact with white-hot charcoal caused small amounts of carbon to combine with the surface layer of iron. This blend of carbon and iron is much harder than pure wrought iron. It is steel. 
Having discovered this method of carburizing or stealing iron, the early smiths made a further advance. They found that if steeled iron was cooled suddenly by quenching, it became even harder, although quite brittle. Finally, they learned that if this hardened steel was then gently reheated, it lost its brittleness, but retained its hardness, a process that came to be called tempering. These three vital discoveries transformed the properties and the potential of iron. Iron ores were much more plentiful than copper, and with the diffusion of the techniques of stealing iron in the first millennium BC, the Iron Age gained momentum. One path that ironworking travelled has only recently been identified in the village of Hallstatt in the Austrian Alps. On the map of this part of Austria, the German word for salt is sprinkled through the valleys as a prefix to the place names, as with Salzburg. Salt has been mined here on and off for 3,000 years. From about 1000 BC, this valley and the immensity of its resources of salt made it an important center of distribution and exchange. Trading salt southeast down through the Balkans, out to the empires of the ancient world around the Mediterranean. But just how important Hallstatt really was did not become clear until the last century, when the most extraordinary find was made on this hillside. Beginning in 1864, excavation unveiled a cemetery of the ancient world. Some 2,000 graves were found, and buried with the dead and the grave furniture was a whole culture in metal. To find bronze was unsurprising, but in these graves there were weapons and ornaments made of iron. The graves of Hallstatt were eventually dated to between 800 and 500 BC. They pushed back the entry of the Iron Age into Europe by some hundreds of years. Eventually, about 600 BC, this region of Austria, the Eastern Alps, called Noricum in the ancient world, became a sort of Sheffield of antiquity. It was up these lovely valleys the trade route, the classical channel for the communication of goods and ideas, that the fires and forges found their way from Asia Minor through the Balkans, and the Iron Age arrived in Hallstatt. And when it got here, it fanned out to put all of Western Europe under the anvil. It hammered its way to the Baltic, to Britain, and to the shores of the Atlantic in the hands of an emotional, energetic, and creative people who during the following 700 years proceeded to lay the political and economic foundations of European civilization, the Celts.
In the first few centuries of the Iron Age, its impact on the lives of ordinary people in Western Europe was neither immediate nor dramatic. This emerges from studies of Iron Age life in Denmark, recreated on the site of an early settlement found near Copenhagen. There is a telltale scarcity of metals here. After the collapse of the Bronze Age, that once universal alloy of copper and tin became too costly for subsistence communities like this one. So was iron, which was reserved for vital uses like hunting spears. <laughs> The main barrier to the wider use of iron was that it could not be melted. Iron workers could not therefore cast objects in iron as their predecessors had cast them in bronze. This inability meant drudgery at the anvil and frustrated the plentiful use of iron in Europe for another thousand years. However, unknown to Europe, that particular threshold had already been crossed in the east. Almost down to our own day, the wall, standing for security and deterrence, has been one of the most familiar military metaphors in history. Its most formidable expression was the Great Wall of China. The Great Wall was begun about 300 BC as a series of isolated ramparts for defense against raiding nomads. It was completed by the Emperor Qing, who founded the first dynasty to rule a unified China. But as history has proved repeatedly, walls are only as effective as their defenders. Today we can be sure that the military technology which built the Great Wall went far beyond the achievement of the wall itself. Only in the last few years it's been possible almost to bring to life the ghosts of the Guardian Army which once stood here 2,000 years ago. To the south of the Great Wall lies the seat of power of the ancient Qing dynasty. One of the most remarkable excavations of the present century has revealed the buried legions of the Emperor's army, and above all, shown to us the skills in metals which place superior weapons in its hands. It began in 1974 with the discovery by a party of village well diggers of a single buried terracotta figure. Now there is steadily emerging from the soil of Xi'an province the most astonishing death watch ever mounted over a departed mortal. From areas already excavated and from test pits, Chinese archaeologists calculate that 6,000 clay warriors accompanied by horses and chariots stand here in formation. They were created to defend their emperor, who was buried in a tomb not yet opened beneath a hill behind them.
No two faces are the same. The archaeologists believe them to be likenesses of the emperor's real soldiers. In this terracotta army, which has stood sentinel like this for 2,000 years, one detail is wholly authentic, their actual weapons. The swords, spears and arrowheads, when cleaned, emerge as sharp and as well-fashioned as when they were made. Analysis has provided the explanation. The weapons are made of sophisticated alloys of up to 15 different metals. The major ingredients are copper, tin and lead. But there are also others which have only come into use in the West in our own time. Aluminium, titanium, vanadium and cobalt. A different kind of advanced technology is represented by this set of intricate castings. They're the trigger release mechanism of the weapon that armed the Emperor Qing's troops in holding the barbarians at bay on the Great Wall. The crossbow. This is a weapon which would not appear in the West for another 600 years. But as well as this proficiency in bronze, as early as the first millennium BC, the Chinese were making parallel advances in working the more technically difficult metal, iron. Amongst those seas of humanity which have constituted China in both the ancient and the modern worlds, the mathematical chances of either inspiration or accident leading to innovation must have been greatly improved. Inside this walled enclosure is an important piece of history from that random harvest experiment. It marks a period of one of the most significant advances in all the history of metals. The exploitation by man of his discovery some 300 years BC of how to cast iron. It was a feat which the Chinese having pioneered, no one else was able to repeat until 1,500 years later in the Middle Ages in Europe. When this site was excavated in 1975, what the archaeologists found was an iron blast furnace of truly remarkable proportions. Just how big it was can be gauged from the size of this huge lump of iron which had collected at the bottom of one of the furnaces. It weighs 25 tons. And remember, this was more than 2,000 years ago, before the dawn of the Christian era, and round about the time the Roman Empire was expanding in the West. And no one outside China handled iron in this quantity until the Industrial Revolution in Britain 200 years ago. And the date is certain, radiocarbon dating methods place it during the time of the Han Dynasty, which lasted in China from about 200 years before until 200 years after the birth of Christ. This is where the furnace itself stood, some six meters high. But what's remarkable about it is not so much its size and its height, as the temperature at which it operated, in excess of 1,400 degrees Celsius. At the temperatures being achieved elsewhere in the world, iron could be reduced only to a sort of spongy mass called a bloom, which then became the raw material of the blacksmith who hammered it and worked it in all those uncountable hours of the forges down the centuries into wrought iron. And that became the tradition of iron making in the West, and as such, it stood in direct descent to techniques which led back beyond the footsteps of history into Neolithic times with stone axes and stone hammers. But in China, it was different. 
because they'd found a way of keeping higher temperatures, the Chinese could make iron flow like water. They treated iron as they treated bronze by pouring it into molds. Here are some of the molds dug out at the same time as the furnace. The Chinese had found a new utilitarian metal from which they could cast implements in iron, which would still be of use. Indeed, they still are in these fields today. A plowshare and a hoe. But casting was only part of the Chinese achievement. Cast iron was high in carbon which made it too brittle for useful tools. Research has shown that by about 450 BC, Chinese metallurgists knew how to remove the carbon on the surface of cast iron and, in effect, create a steel jacket around a cast iron core. It was this discovery which finally made it possible for the Chinese to use iron so comprehensively so early in history. And so, while East and West had entered the Iron Age together by taking the momentous step away from bronze at the same time, they then conformed to Kipling's famous proposition that East is East and West is West by proceeding to go down two totally different paths. Wrought iron in Europe, cast iron in China. But the question that puzzles modern ironmasters still today is how was it that 2,000 years ago, the Chinese could light and keep a fire as hot as this. The explanation of those higher temperatures may have been simply that the Chinese had more efficient bellows. The more air you can blow into a furnace, the hotter it gets. This is a reconstruction in the Chinese Historical Museum in Peking, made from drawings found on the walls of tombs of the Han Dynasty period and built up from Chinese literature, of a possible solution. By this time, it should be no surprise to find that the Chinese had evolved a characteristically independent answer. Uh, whereas in the West, blacksmith's bellows operated on a vertical principle, the Chinese system was horizontal. Now, this system, in which very large bellows indeed could be suspended from an overhead beam, seems to have had much more potential. Certainly, it resulted in much greater volumes of air being moved into the furnace when it was harnessed, as in this case, to water wheels or to animal power. The Chinese control over air supplied to furnaces was always superior to that in the West. And the most intriguing principle which lay at the heart of their successful development of bellows in the ancient world is still to be seen in use in villages in China today. backyard blacksmith in Xi'an is still using the technology of 3,000 years ago, the double-acting box bellows. The handle operates two pistons in upper and lower chambers of the box. Simple flap valves control the airflow so that it pumps on both the push and the pull action. This bellows delivers twice as much air to the furnace in a continuous flow. The box bellows can be scaled up considerably from this backyard size. This was the key to the Chinese success 
in higher furnace temperatures. But the more evidence that emerges for the technological lead that China established over the West in the early Iron Age, the more intriguing becomes her failure to sustain it. All the conditions seem to exist for China to lead the world into an industrial and scientific revolution centuries before it occurred in the West. Historians think the reasons were political and social. China's belief that it was a universe in itself led to dangerous contempt for developments elsewhere. The rise of a stifling bureaucracy anesthetized innovation. It's a controversy which is still at the center of contemporary Chinese politics. The iron masters of the Han period, who were well placed to launch a power-driven mechanized industrial revolution, went on making plows and hoes. China lost an advantage to the West it has never regained. Coincidentally, with that incipient decay in the East, came the rise of Greece in the West, nourished by the most sublime resources of the human intellect. But Greek civilization also drew its strength from more mundane endowments. Silver financed the city-state of Athens, its trade and its commerce. From the mines of Laurium on the southern tip of Attica, a stream of silver flowed through the Athenian treasury. The ancient washing tables and the storage tanks of 3,000 years ago are still there today. This silver of Greece was the envy of less happier lands. It was around this austere and treeless promontory of rock, Cape Sunion in Greece, that two and a half thousand years ago, the Persian fleet sailed towards Athens and to the greatest naval encounter of the ancient world, the Battle of Salamis. To oppose that great array of 4,000 ships and the vast armies of Xerxes, which were already victorious in the field, all the fortunes of war depended upon the relative handful of the Greek navy. At Salamis, under Themistocles, the Greeks won a famous victory. The raising up of a power in Greece, able to throw back the advancing tide of barbarism, which threatened to extinguish its art, literature, and high intelligence, was due in some indispensable measure to the silver mines at Larion in these hillsides. Only rich states could afford the cost of the new kind of warfare. The statesmanship of Themistocles had persuaded the Athenians to forego their dividends from the silver mines to rearm and build the wooden wall of ships that saved Greek civilization. Out of the victory at Salamis and the austerity of this countryside of ancient Attica, Greek culture rose to its brilliant climax in the adornments and enrichments of Athens under Pericles. To him we owe this, the temple of Poseidon at Cape Sunion and the Parthenon. The chosen music of Greece was liberty, to which there was an unsung dimension. The silver mines at Larion were worked by slaves. Their sweat and toil had helped to produce the golden age of Greece, which made Athens the most glorious city of the ancient world. And it was the silver mines at Larion which financed the sword of Athenian power.
By the third century BC, the mines in the hills near Cape Sunyon were spent. And once again, the link between political power and the control of material resources to sustain it was due to be confirmed in the rise of a rival power. The might of the Roman Empire, even 1,500 years after its fall, is still almost palpable. Hand in hand with conquest and the wars of the kings and Caesars, went the practical brilliance and monumental achievements of the world's first technological empire. Few victories the Romans won were more significant than those they achieved over the use and the disposition of vast resources of minerals. Buried in this labyrinth of sculptured hills and valleys behind the Gulf of Cadiz in Spain lies one of the greatest belts of minerals on Earth. Gold and silver and copper have been mined here for 5,000 years. The efforts of the miners who sweated here reach back to the distant horizons of the ancient world and help to sustain its city-states and its empires. Tyre and Sidon, Greece and Carthage and Rome, and in more recent times, Spain, and Britain too, at the zenith of her power. The remarkable chronology of Rio Tinto is visible in this section which the archaeologists have sliced away from the hillside, revealing the mining debris of many centuries. It's a sort of cake of history. Right at the very bottom has been dated as the early Bronze Age, and that shadow depression is thought to have been some sort of rubbish pit. The discovery in mine workings here and near here of mortars and uh, pestles of stone, which were used to crush and to grind the ores, has established that mining did take place here in the early Bronze Age, when stone and bronze tools existed side by side. Above the Bronze Age lie the workings of the Phoenicians. These mines in southern Spain, to them, were at the outer limits of the world as they knew it, at the very edge of the earth. And then next in succession come the darker layers of the Carthaginians. The mines here to them were plunder, the result of conquest. And after victory, the silver they got here became a mainstay of the empire they established in Iberia. That was 500 years before the birth of Christ. And then when Hannibal and the Carthaginians were overwhelmed and the Punic Wars had run their course, Carthage gave way to the great power which then held sway from the Atlantic to the Euphrates and from Britain to the Sahara. The immensity of the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. And the great bulk of this was produced from here to the top in the 500 years that the Romans dug here in the mines they called Tartessos. These are the graves of the Roman miners. Such inscriptions as there might have been on them, long since weathered into anonymity. The Romans came here as conquerors, and mining was to them a prize, a harvest of war, to be conducted by slaves. And in the days of the later empire, under Hadrian, strict regulations governed both the conduct and the welfare of mining. And gradually down the centuries, the Romans advanced their technology, they industrialized the whole place and their social policy. And slowly, the slaves and their fetters gave way to skilled artisans who made their mining more efficient and who had hot water piped to their baths. And these are their graves. The reasons for the still echoing fall of the Roman Empire remain an endless scholarly fascination. In the aggregate of factors which brought it about, the failure of Roman technology where mining is concerned is often overlooked. The Romans were not great prospectors, but they were great plunderers. 
Yet conquest had no further answer when the easily winnable ores near the surface had gone. Their technology, marvelous though it was, could go no deeper. Rome retreated from the underground frontier as well. Her engineers could not cope with the invasion of water into the deeper mines. Debasement of the coinage and inflation followed, ruinously. As the great architecture of the Roman Empire began to crack and fragment, no part of its extensive geography was left unscathed by that slow erosion of will and capacity. Palmyra, in the Syrian desert, was the city at the beginning of the Silk Road to China. It was one of the casualties, as the fortunes of the peoples and places which had prospered under the Pax Romana began to ebb. Palmyra lie the skin and bones of the ancient civilizations of the Mediterranean. By the fifth century, a fuse was burning all around the frontiers of the old world, the barbarian invasions. They brought to a halt the disciplined corporate endeavors which had raised mankind to a new level. The declining Roman Empire was engulfed in that explosion of an overwhelming mediocrity. It left the protracted blank of the Dark Ages. It would be another thousand years before men would once again use metals on the scale the Romans used them, either for life's comforts or for the arts of war. It needed that thousand years before the center of gravity of the ancient world, which had moved with the Iron Age from Asia Minor to the Mediterranean, shifted once more to the west. Everything was silent here by then. But there, an ecumenical culture sprang to life, which revived the lapsed ingenuity of both east and west, and set the peoples of Western Europe on the rise to their long ascendancy and colonization of virtually the whole globe. I'm Robert Raymond and I'm the producer of this series. If the world we live in has a nervous system of copper, the wires of the telephone network, then its skeleton is steel, fleshed out with concrete. Iron, and its alloy steel, is the most widely used and versatile of all the metals. But it was not always so. The first metal to be used on any scale by man was copper, and its alloy, bronze, made possible in the Bronze Age, the first great civilizations of both East and West. As we've seen in this episode, in the ancient world, the change from bronze to iron was both sudden and, to some extent, inexplicable. Iron at that time, in the second millennium BC, was a metal greatly inferior to bronze. And yet within the space of a few hundred years, iron had almost completely replaced bronze in weapons, tools, and all the other artifacts that man uses. Some of the leading work on this metallurgical puzzle is being done today in the United States, at places like the Center for Ancient Metallurgy at the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. The next overseas project one of the scientists who studied this question most thoroughly is Dr. Tamara Steck. It's a very complicated issue and one that's intrigued many scholars for a long time. Um, 
Some years ago, our colleague in England, Anthony Snodgrass, advanced the thesis that the disruption brought about by considerable ethnic and political upheaval in the Eastern Mediterranean around 1200 BC had interrupted the trade routes in both copper and especially tin, the components needed to make bronze. And since the tin was no longer available along the commercial networks, therefore bronze could no longer be made, except on a recycling basis. But of course, the things to be recycled would gradually run out. Um, so he suggested that ancient man turn to iron as a material which was more widely available. Now we have since then been looking at his thesis further and feel that many aspects of it are probably correct. But we also believe that there was a technological component as well. And that is, for ancient people to have turned so quickly from bronze to iron, they must have had some skill in working iron before. That is, they must have been aware of some of the capabilities that could have been produced in, in iron by converting it to steel. And this is the really important change. Iron by itself is a softer metal than bronze, but when it is steeled, carburized, when it absorbs carbon, then it becomes steel and it's a superior metal. Now these iron carbon. objects here, uh, I think, illustrate the, the weaknesses of iron, possibly, as a, as a metal. Would you tell us something about those? Yes, this collection of artifacts here um, was excavated by a university museum expedition at Hassan Lu, a site in northwestern Iran. Um, the site was violently destroyed around 800 BC, and hundreds of uh, iron artifacts have come from the destruction level. Now, one of the interesting things that's been shown by technical studies of the Hassan Lu iron is that these pieces were not made into steel. There are some heterogeneous carburization just in the sort of thing it could pick up in any kind of a forging fire or from the iron bloom itself from which these were forged but they were not deliberately steeled as things were being in the eastern mediterranean at this point now of course they're very corroded and crumbly aren't they that's what that was presumably is what was wrong with iron yes in, indeed i mean it very quickly developed a rusty patina um, and obviously when we see in the pieces of this quiver the iron is extremely unattractive now, whereas the bronze has the wonderful green color that we associate with corroded bronze. Well, now, what was it then that enabled man to move from making things like that, which obviously wouldn't last very long, to stealing? I mean, what was the technological change that took place? We believe it must have been one of pragmatic observation. That is, if um, a metal worker took an object and left it in the fire for a long time in order to forge it, depending on the complexity of the shape he was trying to create. He might have sooner or later noticed a correlation between the amount of time that an artifact was left in the fire and the strength and durability that it had. Um, and from there might have extended the technology to leaving things in the fire for great lengths of time. How we know that this happened is that and when we look at an artifact in cross-section that is if I cut this blade through there and took a section out of it um, and I could see a heavier ring of carbon around the edges with the amount of carbon decreasing toward the interior this would give us the clue that the, th the artifact had been put into a fire and it absorbed carbon in the outer layers where would the carbon come from in the fire the carbon would come from the charcoal in the forging or the smelting fire and where do you think these discoveries took place? On the basis of the information we have at present, I'd say the Eastern Mediterranean is the earliest evidence that we have so far. But we're continually surprised. The more research we do, the more we find earlier and earlier evidences of steel. And they're right now very limited occurrences, sort of odds and ends. But who knows, as uh, analytical programs are increased, we may get quite a different picture in coming years. And do you have any evidence of this taking place in other parts of the world, say in the Far East? Well, at a slightly later time and in a very different way. That the Chinese approach to using iron was as a cast iron, as they use bronze, as our friend Ursula Franklin says, as liquid ceramic. Um, and then when they wanted to make artifacts like this, tools, they would have to decarburize their cast iron rather than by blasts of air, rather than as they did in the eastern Mediterranean by putting it in the fire to have the carbon absorbed into the iron. The basic difference, I understand it, would be that in the, in the uh, west they hammered the iron to make things and in the east they cast it, as you say, like, uh, like bronze. Yes, indeed. 
what's the um, what's the explanation for uh, for the different technologies that arose? What, well, the explanation has to lie somewhere in the different cultural backgrounds of the two areas, and how they came to these kinds of technologies. As out of the fiery furnace so well uh, demonstrates, still in the Near East, there's very much a hammering technology that's used after casting, whereas the Chinese had mastered the most extraordinary ways of casting huge amounts of bronze and then iron um, in a way that no Near Eastern craftsman would really even think of doing today. So it's, it's the uh, approach, the cultural background that made the different approaches come up, arise. From what you've told us, it sounds as if these ancient metal workers were really quite smart. Yes, they were. They were intimately familiar with their environments. They knew these rocks very well. They knew, understood how they worked just from simply observing them over and over and over. I mean, it's axiomatic in the study of ancient metallurgy that smelting is very, very hard. Um, the experiments of John Merkel at Timna bear that out. Professor Madden and I once did a laboratory experiment in which we took very high-grade malachite ore from Australia, crushed it, put it in a graphite crucible, put it in a muffle furnace, and didn't produce copper, metallic copper. And we, thought that we did this for a class, and we thought this was an excellent demonstration for the students to see it's not easy, and that for ancients to have won all the metals that they did that were not native metals, like gold, was a very difficult process, which required considerable expertise, many years of practice. Out of the Fiery Furnace is brought to you by a company that makes aluminum for transportation, construction, and manufacturers of consumer products all around your house. Commonwealth Aluminum. The companion book, Out of the Fiery Furnace, by Robert Raymond, is published by the Penn State Press and is available at bookstores throughout the country.